we are ready to start. So I want to thank everyone for joining this webinar today. You saw my LinkedIn ads or you saw my post. This is how to find investors and raise capital with crowdfunding. And then we're going to talk a lot about what they don't tell you about raising capital online. And I'm just going to set your expectations, tell you what it's like, what needs to be out there. And it's a lot different than what you normally did chasing big check writers. So who's this for? This is for if you're a company owner or your attorney or securities attorney, if you've got a client that's uh, trying to grow their business, looking for capital. You can't find any big check writers in this crazy environment. And I'm talking, we're only halfway in to 2020. And this is the craziest I've seen in my 59 years. Uh, you just started exploring methods to raise capital. This is for yourself or for your client. You had a campaign. Let's say you did a 506C or you had a CF. Your campaign is stalled or the last one failed. You have a great idea or traction and you need to start raising fast to be take advantage of the opportunity. Or you've already got traction, you're a well-established, mature company, you've got a list, a community, and you want to be able to leverage that. You don't want to give away a lot of equity to VCs because you could do it with your community. And you want more control over terms. Let's say you've been out there talking to big investors and they say, I'd love to help you write you a check for two, three, five million dollars, but I want this. And you're like, uh, no, thank you. I've been worked all my life for this. So what we're gonna cover today, you probably see this on a LinkedIn, is crowdfunding free, easy and quick? Are investors waiting for me? Crowdfunding myths and reality. What are the different types of crowdfunding options? What are the costs associated with raising capital? What needs to be in place for investors to write you a check? Why crowdfunding works now more than ever? What is the successful crowdfunding formula? How do I raise $5 million? What's it gonna take to get there? And what are the biggest benefits with the crowdfunding campaign? The first thing, we need to establish a little bit of authority about who we are. Hi, my name is John Stoddard. I co-founded a company, a software company. It was a marketplace. It's a software company. It's still number one in its niche. We sell a 3D asset marketplace. I bought a, a failing e-commerce company, hearing aid company, rebuilt it, and sold it to a private investor, grew it to the second largest uh, e-commerce hearing aid seller online. Uh, I've helped raise over $22 million. That's uh, mostly in my projects that I worked on. I'm also the author of a book called Pitch Deck Secrets, the underground playbook for attractive investors. So I spent a lot of time uh, helping people raise capital. And one of the things I did was offer this book. I got Mike Brett on the phone with me. Mike is CEO of Small Cap Equity Advisors, a fee-based consulting firm, investor relations. He's been a Juris Doctorate for over 30 years, still licensed. He's been in investor relations for 25 years. He's thrilled to probably raised over $80 million. And he's author of two books, Raising Capital for Your Business Through the Use of Private Placements and Asset Protection Planning, How to Protect Yourself from Lawsuits. Now, both of these books are actually listed on Amazon. You can buy them. And he's on his third book. I want to bring in Mike and just uh, welcome him to the party. Yes, I'm here. All right, Mike, introduce yourself and just say hi to the crowd. Sorry. Uh, sure, uh, no problem. Uh, first off, thanks for the opportunity, John. I'm Michael Brett, and I'm associated with uh, John when it comes to the equity crowdfunding. Um, and I'm, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'll answer some questions at the end on their Q&A. Good deal. So why listen to us? Uh, what we're doing here is establish a little bit of authority. We've been around. I'm not a young guy. I'm 59. Mike's a little bit older than I. But uh, we worked on Tequila Commissario, raised 15 million there. Lucas Energy, 20 million dollars there. Uh, Apex Farm Incorporated, 427 uh, percent oversubscribed. That's on Micro Ventures. We got a new client out there on GoBQ Start uh, Start Engine. Uh, together, Mike and I have raised probably over $100 million. So let's do a quick crowdfunding review, 2020, about history. So here's how VCs worked. And if you've ever done this before, started a business and you had to chase uh, money through a big investor, whether it's private equity or a VC or family office, they have the money, you need the money, you must get their attention. They get to decide if they want to give it to you and it kind of looks like this. I mean, I've done a lot of these, probably over 100. You create a pitch deck, you generate a big list, 
go through the list for interest, seek warm intros, and go all the way through this process. What could take a year to do, chasing big check writers, and, and you can put the money in your bank in 2021. And you can see what happens here. Here's what a normal campaign looks like. You got a whole big list, you put them through a funnel, and you get maybe, yes, maybe, yes, maybe, yes. I always think this is dangerous because if COVID comes around or if your sector goes out of favor, Thanos could just say, snap a finger, and your opportunity is gone. You, but I, did you know that this process, which has been adopted by VC, started with whaling chips, so I think over 600 years ago, and two-thirds, that's 66% of boats, did not return. And the ships actually got to keep 20% calling it carry interest. So if you see a VC as, ah, I got 20% carry interest, that's where it came from. So why entrepreneurs, investors help create the JOBS Act? Well, of course, it was growth. Uh, economic growth. So with the help of the SEC, they wrote some laws and you got Reg CF, you got 506, and you got Reg A. A lot of people already know about these features, but they are right for some types of business. Like the Reg CF doesn't have a market, doesn't have any customers, it's still working on the project. Great place to start out. 506, mature business, raising money, uh, more money. Reg A, larger business, big list, thinking about and should be going probably IPO on a bigger exchange, you know, 100, $200 million company or more. So crowdfunding myths, offer it, they will come. Ray, myth number two, raising capital is with crowdfunding is quick, easy and free. Well, gone are those days. There are actually six to 8,000 campaigns live at any given moment. And I'm actually talking about Start Engine and Indiegogo because there are some real companies and real products on those websites that are competing for your an investor's attention and dollars. And they're advertising in the same places equity crowdfunding campaigns do. Also, facts, crowdfunding platform is a digital sales and marketing campaign requiring skills and experience. If it was quick, easy, and free, anyone could do it. And has anybody ever heard of the Google stupidity tax? Just a quick story. I, when I was running my e-commerce company, I was getting a majority of my leads from Google AdWords, and I had I outsourced it to a PPC expert. Something happened, and the next day, I spent $40,000 in a day or something, and I said, what the hell happened, man? It, oh, I'm sorry, somebody forgot to click something or Google changed something. This is called the Google, Google stupidity tax. I, I, I need to set your expectations. If you haven't done crowdfunding before, you are 100%, 100% responsible for driving traffic to your offer. Now, a crowdfunding campaign listing it may help. Ron Miller over at Starting and the chairman over there said, sometimes a, co a company lists on our site and gets enough traffic where it may contribute 20 to up to 40% of their target goal, but never ever depend on them for any traffic or uh, contributions or investment. All right, so what are we looking at right now? Crowdfunding success at CF, like Start Engine, Republic, Net Capital, 246 million since 2016. 506C, now this is not published because most of this is in the background, but there's over 907 million raised and reggae over 2.2 billion. And there's some new proposals coming out the SEC where the CF is gonna be moved from 1 million to 5 billion. I've got my opinions that may work, may not. It seems like it benefits the platform more than it does the customer. And then reggae is going to 50 million to 75 million. The biggest percentage of reggae's 2.2 are from real estate. That's crowd speed. Origin Investments, KBS Direct, Rich Uncle, Real Crowd, those guys. So why crowdfunding works now more than ever? Well, the Job Act has democratized raising capital. Getting press attention has been democratized. I've got a book called uh, Free PR, and I uh, the guy at the write this book is uh, Adrian, and you can find exactly who you want to get a uh, a product mention on Fox, on NBC, on in front of bloggers, in front of podcasters, 
All of that can be found on LinkedIn. You can get in front of billions of people. That's been democratized, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, you name it. Powerful tools to find who, what, where, and how is right at your fingertips. I'm talking about tools like SimilarWeb and a new one from uh, Rand Fishkin called SparkTural. Beautiful tool. Tells you exactly who are the top 10 podcasters in your industry. I mean, if you are doing a product, let's say, I'll give you an example. We are working on a campaign with a leptin uh, for Alzheimer's dementia disease. Type in dementia and it'll tell you the top 10 podcasts. Where to find them? Go to LinkedIn, reach out to them and connect. Building lead funnels has been democratized. You just see guys like Russell Brunson. You could build leads. Every business needs a lead. I don't care. It's CrowdStreet, it's lead. All these other crowdfunding sites, they have to get leads. You could do this fast, instantaneously. Like you could do A-B testing from Kartra, from Keep, that uh, used to be Infusionsoft. Outsourcing tax, task has been democratized. Sometimes like building a funnel uh, took a long time. You, you, you just have to get somebody to outsource it. Now, you could find somebody on Fiverr or Upwork to do that within 24 hours. Or if you needed a logo, or if you needed a, a post image, all of that can be done for $5. The, why, the reason I say $5 is because you should be focusing on the $500 an hour to $1,000 task. Outsource the lower uh, dollar amount. Well, there's 30, 40 million people out of work, that's sad, but COVID-19 has created a once in a lifetime disruptive event. Some of the successful companies started during an economic downturn. Airbnb, Uber, Netflix, Amazon, Dollar Shave Club, I'm going to mention Airbnb because there's a story about these guys started Airbnb. Before the 2008 crash, like they went to investors and investors said, no way, we're giving you money. There's nobody, you know, nobody's going to rent out their room to a stranger. Well, 2008 crashed and then people needed extra income. So rent out your room and boom. But that's an example. Let's get into the secret uh, success formula for crowdfunding and if you've ever been in marketing before, you've probably seen this. It's positioning plus promotion plus automation process. I'm going to just give it a, a kind of a overview of what that looks like. So the first one is positioning. You know this. You've seen this triangle where the generalist, your specialist, and authority. The person that gets paid the most is at the top. This is like the doctor, the brain surgeon. And it's intrinsic value. Like, did you know that the BMW and the Rolls Royce are built by the same manufacturer. They have the same frame, but there's a such higher perceived value with the Rolls Royce, they can charge 200,000 more. And you can actually create this. It can be engineered. This is what your marketplace thinks about you. You can actually get people to believe that you are the best in the marketplace. And you do this by pre-framing all your content. This is positioning. Let me give you some examples. Uh, and I mentioned this before, ClickFunnels. ClickFunnels is a funnel. It's a lead system to bring you in. When you educate yourself, and they do this by help people, by helping people. They're showing people how to create funnels, to bring leads in, to close those leads. They help them. And another one is, let's say, Black Rifle Coffee. Does anybody know these guys? These guys spend some time. They're all combat guys. They came back. They like the coffee. It's about taking a position. They stand for something and they show you what they stand against. I mean, look, there's no doubt these guys are polarizing. They're going to attract some people and they're going to repel some others. That's okay. You are not trying to sell to everyone. Promotion. You need to take massive action to get this started because you've got to do CEO interviews, any opportunity to get in front of somebody, radio, podcast, press releases. PPC ad emails, viral videos, syndicated content, and today, influence. Taking massive action and applying that energy, let's say on an inert object, that could be you or could be your company, creates momentum. And actually, it's, it's physics. It's Newtonian. Just, all right, automation. Look, we are in a great system today because I can buy ClickFunnels $90 a month, unlimited about a, a, a funnels I can create but it's marketing automation. I can market on multiple channels online and automate the repetitive tasks. The, the key is I, I don't want to talk to everybody. I only want the best ones to filter to the top and have those conversations. 
I got to be able to automate all of the rest and get people out that are just tired dick. Process. Measure your results. And look, if you're going to spend money online, the first thing you need to do is make sure you're measuring results. And with crowdfunding, with anything, doing sales, the most effective way uh, to find investment capital is to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. Now, this is Zoom, phone calls, or face-to-face. -face. Now, it, you can go to CrowdStreet right now and say, I'm interested in one of these apartments right there. And they take you to a webinar because they want you to meet the people behind this project. You've got to be able to have Zoom calls, phone calls, or face-to-face. -face. If those are not happening, you've got to rework uh, your promotion, your process, your uh, everything else in your success formula. So add all these together. That's your positioning, your promotion, your automation, your pr process. That's your success formula. Keep that in mind because you will get so much more leverage if you are in the celebrity authority position. I mean, I'm talking about all your other work. All right. So let's get an example. How do you raise $5 million? And it, here's by the numbers. I got to get a, one person to write a check for $5 million. That's easy to do. Two people to write a check for 2.5. Five people to write a check for a million. 200 people to write a check for 25,000. 5,000 people to write a check for 1,000. So I got to start thinking, how am I going to get 5,000 people to write a check? How many people do I need to see my offer to get them to write that check? Let's take a look at those numbers. And these are digital marketing averages. Just what it costs to do this. So I've got to get 5,000 people to write a check for a dollar. At 0.25 conversion ratio, I need to get in front of 2 million people. Now, you're already thinking like 2 million people. That is a lot of ads. I mean, I don't have that kind of money. Or I got to have a conversion ratio of 0.5 in front of a million, 1%, 500,000, 2%, 250,000. The better your conversion ratio, the less money you're going to spend, the better conversion you have. Before we even get into that and start wasting money, because you don't want to go out to 2 million people, you need to be able to find your investor. Who dream investor is. Let's take a look. If I was doing $2 million and I didn't know who my avatar was, I said, look, you're going to waste a lot of money. You're going to, you don't know who your dream investor is. And this is not about creating the next killer ad. It's about having a conversation already taking place inside the investor's head, mine. Uh, and the, you need to understand them basically better than they understand yourselves. I mean, there are stories where if, if you're a distributor and you've got a new product, We'll go to the distributor and say, hey, I'd like to, I'd like to have to offer this, uh, my new product into this distributor. And they goes, no, that's not going to fit because it doesn't fit our avatar. Or yes, that fits. It doesn't fit their avatar. You've got to be able to make sure that is in sync. So your dream investor is, you've got two categories here. You've got your investor, you've got your customer, and you've got kind of a convergence. And a customer is like, your product or solution. What is the pain to pleasure solution? And an investor is, it's always, it's pretty easy. It's especially if you're going to the big real estate is like, how much money are you going to make? What's my IRR? You've got to be able to get really clear on who your dream investor, and that's critical to your crowdfunding success. Don't even think about just like, I'm going to just put some blanket ads out there and see who comes in. Because you're, if you throw, uh, I, I, but here's, here's I, I've done a lot of pitch decks, raise some money, and Mike has too. And here's what investors want to know. They want to know who your customers are, that you know who your customers are. They want to see your story, your passion, why you did this, your traction, your numbers, your profits, that's very important in this COVID kind of environment. All your KPIs, whatever they are, like marketplace KPIs are different than the SaaS KPI. Your commitment and your vision. They want to be able to turn their money into more money. And you've got to be able to show them how that was done. You've already done it. You need, secret number three, you need traffic. And this is Russell Brunson. He's the founder of ClickFunnels. That's a billion company right now and he's only got about 140,000 customers in SaaS but they're paying anywhere from 90 to 500 dollars a month on that SaaS package but here's the biggest problem and he's seen this because he's uh he's I think over three billion dollars in transaction through his SaaS application 
the biggest problem that most entrepreneurs have is not creating an amazing product or service. It's getting their future investors and customers to discover they exist. Every, every year, businesses start fail because they don't understand one essential skill. That's the art and science of getting traffic. And guess what? Traffic's not a problem. It's like a water faucet. I mean, just turn it on. It's everywhere. Get it from uh, Facebook ads, Google ads, YouTube, LinkedIn. It's just turn it on. It's all over there. But where do you get the traffic? There, there are three types of traffic for you. There's traffic you own, there's traffic you pay for, and traffic you earn. Let's take a look at let's take a look at those individually. Traffic you own. That's your list. If you're a startup, no customers, you don't have a list. Mature business, list of 100, list of a million, whatever that is. What's that list worth? I mean, if you sent out an email today to 5,000 people for an offer, how many people bought that? That's kind of what your list is worth. If you don't have a list, you got to go directly to traffic you pay for or traffic you earn. Let me show you what traffic you pay for. That's pay per click. That's Google AdWords. That's LinkedIn. That's Facebook. That's Instagram. This is an example campaign. Advertising spend. We spent thirty-four thousand dollars to hit a hundred thousand dollar goal, and these are the numbers there. That these are actual. So just kind of set your expectations for that. If that's all you do, traffic you earn. That is press, likes, shares. Followers, influencers, uh, TV, radio, podcasters, uh, SEO, tweets. I'm going to say podcasters are almost as important today and as maybe as TV or uh, a news network because some of these people have millions and millions of followers. And if you get on their podcast, Jason Calcanis is his startup one, everybody's going to know who you are because all of the top VCs follow them. And here's one great benefit to all of these groups right here, traffic, you earn. They need your story as much as you need them. They need content. They've got to fill, they've got to eat, they've got to fill it up. It's not really a downside. It's just characteristics of this type of traffic is relationships. It takes time. There's no shortcuts here. 1-800-GOT-JUMP uh, actually built a billion dollar business starting with in-house PR. Just hired a guy, use LinkedIn, and start reaching out to people on LinkedIn and sharing the story. That took time, wasn't automatic. I want to give you an example. I I'm working for a consumer, Mike and I are working for a consumer brand, and it was a perfect fit for, say, popular mechanics in their camping division. So I reached out to the guy that handles that, the editor, two months ago and said, hey, would you like to connect? I have this interesting project that, that might be of interest to you. Uh, let's happy to talk about it. It took two months for him to accept my connection and then have a conversation. And then we got a product for him to evaluate. Two months. It's not overnight. Number four, uh, tell stories. Everybody know who this is? is Seth Godin. I, I'm not sure how it's pronounced its uh, last name. Stories don't teach us anything new. Great stories agree with your worldview. Hold on one second. I got a couple people in trying to get in and I've got to admit those. And here's how to cross this chasm. So you over here, investors over here, there's three steps to always get there. And it's called the hook. That means every post you make, every picture, every video you do, you're trying to get an investor to engage with your story or content. That's the hook. That's kind of like fishing, use the hook. It's got to be of interest. It's got to be appealing to them. It's got to be inside their head. What's bugging them? What do they need now? Number two, story. This is the chance. You have a very small window. As soon as they click on your ad or move over to something, this is where you make a connection. This is where you create desire and this epiphany bridge saying, aha, maybe, it, maybe it's a new opportunity. Maybe it's a new process. Maybe it's a new way to do it. You're show, showing that, aha, I could do it too. Uh, and this is the offer. It, it needs to be irresistible, uh, meaning there's got to be a lot of value to, their, to them. I mean, for instance, if you were looking for an investor, they've got all kinds of places to go to now. Where are they going to put their money 
what they believe in the most, they make the most money, but it's most secure. It's got to be irresistible value. Now, you can't offer money back guarantee, but you could offer, if, if one of these three is not working, if you're getting a lot of people in your hook, everybody seeing your story, but nobody taking a, a look at your offer, you're not providing enough value. And that's how you build the bridge, hook, story, offer. Uh, types of stories. Now, like I said, I did a lot of pitch decks before, and you create stories based upon how your operation looks. You could be a manufacturing company, you could be a SaaS company, you could be a tequila company, but it, it, it's different. Like for instance, customer story. This explains the value, like a transformation before or after. I mean, this could be a, uh, let's say a breast exam uh, portable. And now it can tell you a lot more about what's happening before they have to go to MRI. And they did this, uh, they went to pain to pleasure that they solved their problem sooner. Uh, industry, this disruptive products shows you know what you're talking about and idea could be huge. The company that I think that fits this industry is Uber. It just took off, change how we ride in cars. Origin story, high social benefit, taps into the investor's desire for meaning. Now, one of the perfect examples of this is, uh, what's that sandal company called Tom Shoes? Like everybody thinks they're doing good if they're buying a shoe and that second pair of shoe is donated to somebody that doesn't have money. Unfortunately, uh, that doesn't work because it puts a shoemaker in Africa out of business. But that's how that works anyway. That's emotional appeal. Venture, immediate traction. Feel like you're on a train that's headed for something big. Perfect example of this is Facebook. Let me ask you a question. What type of story gets more press that every, usually what everybody wants to hear more than any other? Well, I'm gonna answer for you. It's how I did it. It's you coming from behind. It's you coming from overwhelming obstacles or a bad background or tough background or survive this or what it is. It, you know why that is? It's, this is called the hero's journey. There's a, a guy, uh, Joseph Campbell wrote a book called Hero with a Thousand Faces. It's a book about, and an entrepreneur or hero takes this journey to call to adventure. He meets a mentor. He uh, meets the uh, is, uh, uh, bad guy, which is could be anything, which could be a competition, which could be status quo. He gets his transformation and he returns. George Lucas used this template for Star Wars. And basically all the movies, Hollywood blockbusters are based upon this hero's journey. And with crowdfunding, we know that a lot of, you can't mention a lot of details about your deals. You can't say, okay, a campaign ends in 90 days or like this. There's, there's a lot of details we shall not mention online. But what you could do is here's some content ideas. You could have announcements. You could be evergreen. You could be seasonal. Or you could do stunts. But putting out, cultural, uh, putting out content like this about yourself, about your company, about your goal, is going to attract those people that are interested in your deal. Uh, here's another uh, uh, example. I like to use these guys with Black, Black Rifle Coffee. Evan, he's the founder of Black Rifle Coffee. Uh, special Forces guy came back from theater over there uh, and just tells his story. Does it really well on YouTube. Now he was they were doing a bunch of funny YouTubes before they did this, but now they did five to twelve minute videos about themselves, like who we are, what we came from. You know, tough story. I, I mentioned this bottom story right here is uh, by Muhammad Wali. Muhammad was an Afghani that actually uh, was just an interpreter. And he, he did so well for US that he found his way to the United States. When Evan heard that he made his way to the United States, he reached out to him, sent the car, picked him up, and hired him. And Muhammad works for Black Rifle Coffee right now. But that's a great feel good story for them. So let's talk about a little crowdfunding benefits. And this is really important because it, if it's right for you, you are in control of the process and terms. Remember what I said about VCs, like, 
you could put all these, you could cast a wide net and see a thousand VCs that want you. And you get all the way down to one or two, and one says yes, the other says maybe, but they're not sold on your idea until your money's in the bank. But you're in the control of this process with uh, crowdfunding, and you're in control of the terms. Uh, some other pro uh, types you could offer, revenue share, preferred stock, convertible notes, common stock, membership units, save and debt. Now, uh, a new proposal that came along with the CF going from 1 million to 5 million talks about revenue share out there. They're, they may limit that. I'm not really sure how to read that yet, but it's still available. And guess what? Valuation. You could have, you could create this valuation uh, for your company. Talk about this just a little bit because this is always a sticking point. Because if you're in this stratosphere over here thinking your company's worth $5 billion and this VC thinks it's worth $12 million, uh, look, he's not going to invest because you'll never be on the same plane. You don't want to be this guy. This is uh, prestige worldwide, $100 billion market with uh, MC and uh, parties. Just don't do it. Just make sure you're really clear about the size of your market. That's your total addressable market, service addressable market, service obtainable market. That's somebody you could service in the next 12, six to 12 months that you can go get those customers right now. But like I said, make sure you're kind of on target. Like nobody's gonna buy a overinflated company. You know what, who said this? Something is only worth what someone is willing to pay for it. It was actually said in the first century, BC by Publilius Cyrus, a Syrian slave from Italy who earned his freedom with his wit and writings. That's been around for a while. So you can have a, uh, a great company, a lot of traction, but if you think it's worth a billion dollars and the investor who's done 10 other investments in that same sector and the same type of company only thinks it's 12, that's what it's worth because that's what he's worth putting a check into. Benefit number two, you are simultaneously raising capital and acquiring customers, advocates, ambassadors, fans to share your story. You can leverage these people to start like, hey, help me sell this product. Not sell the product, but talk about this. I think this is the, one of the most important because we talked about this earlier with Russell Brunson ClickFunnels. You are sharpening your customer acquisition skills. You know where they are and you know how go, to go get them and you know what it's going to cost. You know what kind of ads it's going to take. You know what the funnel looks like. You know what the process. All those expectations are set, set and then you could share those with uh, your investor. Because the bottom line is like, if you could, can you turn a dollar into $3? Well, I've done this so many times. I, like I said, I've been raising money for my own ventures. If I've got an operation, I'm on one side of the table and an investor is on the other side of the table. And then it, it, he or she's going to look at me and go, John, if I give you $1 million, can you turn it in 3 million in X amount of time? I mean, I'm going to say yes or no. Yes, I'm going to have to defend it and justify it or not. Benefit number three. Your campaign immediately adds capital to your balance sheet, which can actually be used to fund more marketing activities. I mean, you could start seeing money in your bank in 30 days. Now, if a process goes well, if CF, you know, they finish you, they onboard you, and you that could happen in 15 days, you could start, uh, you could already be prepping people in your market, say, hey, when I start this campaign, it launches, it's got a lot of momentum going for it, and as soon as that happens, you can start marketing. I'm going to give you an example. We have a pharmaceutical company. They're doing a CF raise. Uh, and they're, I think, maybe $175,000, $180,000. But, it, but it's a pharmaceutical company. But they really need $10 million to go to uh, phase one clinical, uh, excuse me, phase two clinical trials. That's $10 million. So we actually need to syndicate it. So they need enough money to find a broker dealer network company that has access to institutional investors that can write a check for uh, you know, 5 million, 10 million. How much can you spend, expect to spend to raise capital through crowdfunding? 10 to 20%. I mean, if you're gonna, do, if you're gonna try to raise $1 million, you can probably spend about 100,000 to get there. 5 million, probably 500K to, to spend more. 
The average CF campaign, if they do it by themselves, costs $22,000 to raise, and the average raise is about 300,000. This is over 20 companies. And they spend about 241 man hours. That, that means a lot of posting, a lot of SEO work, uh, not a lot of ad spend. A Reg A can cost anywhere from 300,000 to $2 million. You know, to be successful in a crowdfunding campaign, you need traffic. But if you don't have any customers yourself, you don't have a list, you can't go to your list, you can't multiply your list, you need more. And if you don't have, uh, let's say, SEO or uh, press or anything, you need more. And if you don't have any money in the bank, you have to pay for it, you need more there. Traffic's not free. There is always going to be a cost of investor acquisition. There is always a cost of capital. Now, if you hire an investment broker, these are the only guys, only guys that could take a success. I want you to warn, warn you about that because you may find say goes, hey, I'm raising uh, 506C, but, uh, and I can go find money and yeah, I'll take a success fee. You need to find out if they're broker dealers because they're the only ones that are allowed by the SEC and FINRA to take a success fee. They can take it on the back end. It helps you, right? But it can actually be higher if you lack the experience to do it. Now, this is where I'm going to get in, where Mike and I are going to a little talk about how to jumpstart your crowdfunding campaign. That's why you're here. Mike and I, uh, we have this big email list, double opt-in accredited investors. And here's where I'm going to bring Mike in, Mike Brett, JD, talk a little about where that list came from and how we use it. Yeah, John, thanks a lot. Um, I've been around for 25 years, and I used to host uh, a syndicated talk radio show called the Wall Street News Hour, and I produced a television show for about 12 years called Let's Talk Stock that we filmed on the floor of the uh, NASDAQ Stock Exchange, uh, where we interviewed uh, investment bankers, broker-dealers, family offices, and CEOs of public companies. So through that 25-year process, uh, plus doing a lot of road shows, uh, developed this list of uh, retail and institutional investors that like to take a look at deals. Yeah, and we uh, keep the list clean, updated. You know, we'll ping them and say, hey, still looking for deals. We'll send them deals. So, I mean, it, it's going to fluctuate up and down that $2 million. Uh, Mike and I, we got about 64,000 connections between us both and some other people in our uh, our group. We are actually influencers because – the 15,000 people in my group, uh, I would say about 70 to 80% of them are CEOs, founders, or presidents. These guys are most likely to have cash and to invest in other projects. Uh, we want to crank out press releases. We've got a system for this. Look, we don't ever believe or think and set expectations that if we send out a press release, a reporter is going to see it and they go, you know what? I want to get these guys on the line. I want to do an interview and get them on a show or something. That doesn't happen. Press releases are great for SEO. It's just about content and getting that out there. But you still want to do SEO, uh, CEO interviews, radio podcasts. You're still out there actively looking for the bloggers, the podcasters, trying to get you in front of all the business networks or lifestyle networks, whatever your product is to get you mentioned. Uh, we got uh, templates for viral videos, syndicated content, articles, interviews, blog posts. If you're on this webinar right now, you probably responded some pieces of content from my feed. And I've got a whole bunch of stuff. What, I'm, what I was trying to do is write headlines that were inside you, help you out some way providing content. This uh, for a script, direct launch, a perfect investor webinar. Now, every webinar has to have some kind of book story offer inside of it. There's got to be a flow to it. There's got to be a good feeling when they come out and there's got to have a call to act. Uh, LinkedIn ads target investors. Facebook's out there. I'm not a big fan of Facebook anymore, but if you've got a big B2C product, uh, Facebook is a great audience to do. The cost per click is actually going up a lot because everybody's on there. There's also LinkedIn. If you've got a B2B product or a larger raise, there are ways to target the exact people that you want in LinkedIn. Now, your cost per click for Facebook is going to be uh, five to ten times higher, but you can get an ad right in front of their face. Uh, also, systems to automate your investor lead process. We like to use platforms or SaaS products like uh, ClickFunnels, Kartra, or Keep, which you should be uh, infusing soft. Depends on what it's need for. 
And if you're a type of business that looks like you're going to need a $10 million raise and you use CF just as a stepladder to get, uh, raise money for that, and then to get a broker dealer, we have a very strong broker dealer network. Mike's got a Rolodex or, or a really big list of those folks. All right, so here's a little bit about our criteria, what we're looking for. It's a mid-sized company, 11 to 49, 50 to 100 employees. We'd like to see more mature companies, 2.5 plus a million dollar revenue, happy customer base, strong management team, CEO committed time and resources to capital raise what the CEO looks like. I'm gonna talk about, the reason it's red is, I'm gonna talk about it in a little bit. Industry growing as opposed to out of favor. Now, there's a lot of things right now, as you can see, out of favor. Could oil be out of favor? Yes, could be a buying opportunity. Are commercial properties out of favor right now? Yes, possible. COVID, everybody's home in the quarantine, they can work from home. Uh, there are people, some people I follow in San Francisco saying that commercial property is going to get demolished. And there, I've seen some opinions on the other side. Well, I have to see how that goes. I mean, if you could do your technical work, all your work from home, why drive into an office? Uh, broad uh, products with broad services, uh, consumer appeal. Just make sure your total addressable market is good for that. Just because you build it doesn't mean they're going to come. And timing, demand, events, behavior change, political, disruptive, whatever that is. So here's what a CEO looks like. When I say to risk everything, I don't mean risk like put all your money in, all your chips into the table. I mean commit 100% and, and kind of step out your comfort zone, kind of like a Richard Branson. Look at this guy, man. He, how many billion dollar companies has this guy built doing stunts? I mean, who's read his book? I mean, he talks about this hot air balloon stunt where he almost got killed. The other ones, not close. Wearing a dress, could you do that to launch a bridal company? But a CEO that's committed all in. Push yourself. If you got a 90-day commitment, massive action campaign, and you say, I'm going to run three miles a day, you do it every day. Rain, sun, snow. You got to keep your eye on the prize. Every time you hit that little hill, say, eye on the prize, commit to the goal. Anybody read this by Jesse Itzler? He's, he's married to the uh, Sphinx uh, billionaire. Uh, anyway, he lived with, had a seal live with him for 30 days or more, something like that. And he was able to push himself 40% more. The seals have this saying that the only easy day was yesterday. All right, timing. Let's talk about that. Demand, events, behavior change, political disruptive. This is uh, Bill from Idea Lab. He's got a nice little uh, lab down in uh, LA. And he examined some in his portfolio, outside his portfolio, and he found the top five factors in success over more than 200 companies is timing. It's a perfect example of timing. I'm using it right now, it's Zoom. Let me give you another example. We have a client with that's got an Alzheimer's dementia drug. And Jesus, look what happened when some of the governors sent their loved ones back to the nursing homes. We call that, it was like a death sentence. Horrible, horrible deal. Also, uh, you know, there's other, some uh, political. So timing's very, very important about your product and how easy it is to talk about what's happening in the flow. And, it's kind of like just going to Google and Google Trends and seeing where the keywords are going. If it's moving up, you're on a great trend. Let's talk about a little few more testimonials, kind of close it out real quick here. Um, I worked with, like I said, Mike and I worked in a number of different sectors. He's worked in cannabis, a different company than I have. I worked in cannabis with a buddy I knew back from Intuit. And he did a uh, eight, 8 million raise for PIO and I worked on an acquisition 7.5. Unfortunately. Cannabis is out of uh, favor right now, that sector. This stock, I think it's worth 0 0.001 cent on uh, uh, TES in Canada. Uh, Turbo Squid worked on that. We raised money from uh, Intel, uh, Advantage Capital, and actually Kodak. Kodak uh, kind of a dragged along on that one, but no longer business. Uh, acquisition uh, for a library of courses and hearing aids right here. Um, this is the e-commerce company. One of the best sources to go back to, towards 
for funding is the manufacturer of the product. They had a great product and I was selling a lot of it. And they wanted me to sell more. And I came back to them and said, look, we have mutual vested interest. So if you have helped me invest in advertising, I'll sell more of your products. That happened. So total, Mike and I, over our careers, raised over $100 million. What we charge, I'm gonna get into this just a little bit here. We charge 25 decay to get started. Uh, it's approximately about 10% of the raise. The reason we charge this is there's duplicate things happen. Like I said, not only are you raising the money, but you're also acquiring investors and customers for your business. So this is not a success fee. We're not a licensed broker dealer. We're paid up front to start the next following months. We are a marketing company. And we only take about three to four clients a month based upon the amount of time spent to do this. When we get involved, now this is really important too. This is what I like to say drag race. I don't know if a lot of people do drag racing, but you can't just start like pull up to the drag race in the quarter mile and turn on right where the green light hits, you turn on your car and then you hit the gas. And these guys have already been, built a car with massive amounts of power behind it. And they have the engine going and it's revved up and it's ready to go. And as soon as that green light hits, they go from zero to 200 miles an hour in a very short period of time. That's the point. Everybody's heard this. I can't remember who said this. I think it's like, uh, well, dig your well before you're thirsty. It's great. If you're doing a project, you say, I need to start raising money, but I got to get my uh, financial work, PPM, 506, uh, compliant. Start finding out where your investors are simultaneously while you're doing that paperwork. Because when that is cleared, then you could just launch and hey, we're ready to take your money. It's a lot easier to go get momentum on that first day when you just open up, turn on the green light. Here's where I'm gonna bring in a special guest today. Uh, I, I wanna talk about, there's, I, I've got a lot of people on the line here and some are attorneys, securities attorneys, and some are customers looking to raise money. Now, I reached out to Eric because uh, he did some work for 506 Cs and other attorney work. We're not partners, we haven't done any business together, I reached out to him and frankly, he's the first guy that said he wanted to do the uh, webinar. So I just want him to talk a little bit about what a PPM is, what regulation D is, why would I not just do an IPO? Real, do you really need a PPM and some risk factors? So Eric, if you're on the line. Yeah, hi. So um, I'm Eric Weingold. My law firm is Weingold Law. We are PPM lawyers. And the website is ppmlawyers.com. And um, we're one of the only law firms in the U.S. today that focuses exclusively on this pr type of work, private placement work, ra raising capital. So, um, and I'm a securities lawyer with over 20 years experience doing this kind of work. So I'm just, and I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. Uh, not a lot of time left, so I'm going to try to run through this quickly, and I, I think we're going to have some questions at the end. But in any case, I, I want to start with the general rule, which goes back to 1933 with the Great Depression. Uh, the, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, decided to uh, avert a Great Depression from happening again to protect the country from that happening by making it illegal for companies to sell their securities. What, what was happening in 1933 was was people were, were, were raising capital without anyone knowing too much about these companies. So, so the SEC came up with some regulations that said you have to register with the SEC before you can raise capital. And that means providing certain disclosures and getting approval by the SEC. Now that's an IPO, uh, generally speaking. The problem is it's a very time consuming and very expensive endeavor and not everyone can do that. And there are tons and tons, millions of small businesses and startups that are looking to raise capital that need to get access to capital. So the SEC came up with ex various exemptions to, these, to that general rule. And that's uh, what Reg CF is, that's what Regulation D is, and that's even what Regulation A is. And so, and for each of these regulations, however, there are certain steps that you need to take, legal steps that you need to take to make sure that you are in compliance. And they all generally involve a, a level of disclosure. So you need to create 
uh, something that's often called a PPM, which stands for Private Placement Memorandum. And it's like a prospectus. Um, and in, in the case of a Regulation D, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a mini IPO uh, type of prospectus. It provides disclosures about the company, about what you're offering to investors, what the risks are, uh, what they will get in return for their investment, uh, information about the people that are involved and some other things. Um, so, so that's, a, that's essentially a disclosure document that needs to be drafted and provided to investors. Regulation D, as I said, is one of those exemptions to that general rule that allows you to raise capital without having to register with the SEC. So you are not registering with the SEC under Regulation D. You are, you are merely providing the certain disclosures, required disclosures to investors, and then filing a form known as Form D with the SEC. And, and they don't have to approve it. In fact, they don't review it uh, for merit at all. And so it's a much, it's a much more lightly regulated type of, uh, type of transaction, and which is why millions of people raising hundreds of, uh, I, I don't remember what the number was, but billions of dollars under Regulation D. And it works for anyone who wants to raise any amount of capital. There's no dollar limit to the amount of capital that you can raise under Regulation D. So it's really critical that we do that. Um, why not just do an IPO? The reason is because you can't. It's going to cost you hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's going to take you nine months and uh, there's no market for your securities, presumably at this point, at this stage. It's, it, is a, it is something you, you do down the road after you achieve certain thresholds and certain successes. Uh, so you start with Reg CF, Regulation D, and Regulation A. Um, so the next question is, do I really need a PPM? Well, that, the answer is, and this is a very legal answer, it depends. And it depends on a lot of factors and exactly what your transaction is. It depends on who your investors are, how well you know them, if they are investors that you don't already know. It also depends on the sophistication uh, and net worth of these investors uh, and how many investors. Uh, but typically, a PPM is recommended and, and, or required in, in most instances, and it is the document that you would use to impress and attract investors, number one, but also equally, if not more important, protect you from liability and compliance issues. So it's the document that provides risk factors, uh, for example, and among other things. And risk factors are all the ways really that investors can lose their money. And it's really, in criti it's really critical that you spe specify exactly what those risk factors are. And as a lawyer doing this kind of work, we custom draft these risk factors so that they're company and industry specific. They're not boilerplate, they're not template, they're not overbroad. In fact, the SEC has indicated that overbroad risk factors such as a statement, you can lose all your money, is not a good enough risk factor uh, to satisfy compliance issues. So altogether, um, that's the legal side of things. It's, 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 it's step one to this type of capital raise. I would say to you, uh, do not accept funds from investors without the legal in place because then you could be really exposed to liability. Some of the really bad things that the SEC can do is they can make you return the money that you've raised and they don't care if you spent it. They can, um, they can even bar you from ever raising capital again under their regulations. It's a very harsh and serious result, but they do do that from time to time. And they can even convert it to a criminal proceeding. So it, it is really, really important. Plus you really want to build your raise on a solid foundation. So the, the legal part is extremely important. Uh, I hope I didn't rush too much. Um, it, uh, but no, I, I that's, uh, the time. Rick, that's perfect. I just want to bring you in because uh, even though Mike is a uh, licensed uh, JD in California, uh, he just doesn't do this paperwork. He doesn't like it. I mean, Mike right. can talk for himself, but he's told me that about a hundred times. Uh, we talked about his crowdfunding free, easy, quick. We answered that. Our investors getting free. We answered that. Crowdfunding myths and reality facts. Number four, what are the different types of crowdfunding options? What are costs associated with the raising capital? We talked about that. What needs to be in place for investors to write a check? We talked about that. That's the uh, trust like you, uh, and know you. Uh, number seven, why crowdfunding works now more than ever. We talked about that. Number eight, what is the successful crowdfunding formula? We showed you that. How do you raise $5 million? We kind of set some expectations about 
how many people need to write a check, how many people you need to put the offer in front of. Uh, and one of the biggest benefits with crowdfunding and some legal uh, PPM stuff from our guest, Eric. I want to thank him for joining us here. Thank so you. I need to say this. This is a little bit of disclaimer. We're almost to the end. The amount of capital raised are our personal figures. We are not applying that you're going to duplicate them. Our results will vary, uh, depend on many factors, including not limited to your background, experience, and worth ethic. All business entails risk as well as massive and consistent effort and action. If you are not willing to accept that, we cannot help you. So uh, it is time to open it up for questions. And here's how it's going to work. I'm not going to unmute you. I just need you to type those into the chat box. I will read those off and direct those to myself, to Mike, or to Eric. So 